I'm Claudia Anderson. My background is in environmental science and GIS, and I naturally currently work for my company's IT department. My name is Mitchell Jabs. I took a bit more linear approach uh, with my career. I, my background is in coastal environmental science, and I currently work in environmental science. Right. <laughs> so we've noticed a bit of a common theme during this conference, especially yesterday, but also carrying through today, that a common theme is communication. And so many, we're dealing with such complicated uh, problems and we're looking for solutions and we cannot come to a consensus if we can't understand each other. So we'd like to take a different approach with our message and convey uh, via the language of honeybees. Um, so we'd like to start with an interpretive dance. <laughs> Fascinating fact. Bees dance maps to tell other bees where the good food sources are. And this has nothing to do with our presentation. <laughs> but it actually is relevant. Um, a 2014 study in the UK did conclude that um, scientists can decode honeybee dances to map high volume uh, pollinator habitat. And this can impact land use decisions. So it's all connected. Good point. Okay, you go first. So we're gonna talk about power. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about Stantec. Uh, like Mott McDonald, um, Helen's presentation, the, lots of the same issues uh, with, between Stantec and, and Mott McDonald. We have 400 locations around the globe and about 22,000 employees. We are an AEC consulting firm, architectural and engineering. Uh, we have about 2,500 GIS users in some capacity. And uh, we have about 40 members that are on our transmission routing and siting team. And they have evaluated thousands of miles of transmission lines throughout North America. And they come from a diverse variety of specialties. So as Petra noted um, so beautifully, we are in um, a wild world at the moment. Um, we are so reliant on digital technology. We are ordering our groceries online. We are charging our cars uh, just like we would our cell phone. And we're building, we're shipping, we're more mobile than ever, and we are jamming. Um, and so with that comes this direct need um, for more power. Um, we need to power all of these modern conveniences that we love and rely on. And um, the way we produce power is changing at a rapid pace. Um, you know, states and um, utilities um, and other companies have either mandated or committed to really ambitious um, clean energy goals. Um, and these goals range, but many um, follow a similar trend as here in California. Um, the state has committed to 50% of renewables by 2030. That's 10 years. Um, so these goals are, um, are fantastic and um, you know, we're making great strides, but it's just not going to be possible to meet these goals and keep our energy backbone um, as strong as it needs to be without the introduction of new transmission infrastructure to tie the grid together and connect these new forms of generation. And so um, the problem is that we're not building it fast enough. It's a hard thing to plan, it's a hard thing to get approved, and it's not happening quickly enough to tie the grid together. And um, it is, as I mentioned, it's becoming, it's increasingly difficult uh, to route transmission um, because we can't decide on where to put it and we can't all come to consensus. So general theme of this week is we need consensus. We need everybody to come together and tie the data and the people together. Um, so as we think about routing transmission, we're working around cities, homes, um, designated habitats, conservation lands, um, things that we want to avoid, and um, it doesn't leave much room for the introduction of new linear infrastructure. So hundreds of miles of transmission has to go somewhere. Um, you can all appreciate how hard this is. You're all in, in an industry that struggles with these, um, these same challenges. And so how do we work around these constraints to get the transmission infrastructure that we need, um, you know, planned, agreed upon, um, you know, permitted, uh, engineered, constructed, and um, built, you know, quickly enough to, uh, to stay on track and meet our goals. 
Um, we use GIS. We use it as a vehicle uh, to bring order out of chaos and really bring everyone with us and drive consensus along the way um, so that we can lay the foundation for the subsequent steps and be efficient. So we have a multitude of data. We've been doing this for years and years. How do we get from this big spaghetti mess mashup of exponential options for a segment uh, combinations to get power from point A to point B. How do we get th from that to this? A single agreed upon transmission line alignment. Of course, Mitchell mentioned we use GIS. Cartography and GIS have been used to site transmission lines for years to identify potential resource impacts. So this is nothing new. I, many of you probably remember overlaying maps over maps over maps to determine uh, which resources could be impacted. But Stantec's transmission routing and siting team has created a tool, a route comparison tool, that uh, streamlines the process a bit. It breaks the larger resource priorities into smaller manageable micro constraints they can be evaluated individually and then collectively to increase the understanding of the potential impacts of each of the alternatives. So what does it do? It breaks the potential routes into unique segments, uses GIS to extract information for each segment, and links that to a workbook. There the criteria are quantified for each segment, and the segments can easily be compared. For example, when comparing segment six to segment seven, the tool selects segment six because, for example, it skirts a wetland or, and it avoids a desert tortoise burrow and it doesn't cross an elementary school playground. Then it keeps a record of the criteria for decision making and it can be referred to and reevaluated when new information comes alight, to light. For example, a dinosaur bone is found in the path, which actually pretty easy thing to happen in Utah. We then bring that information into what we're all using here, some kind of interactive geospatial platform that makes it easier to engage uh, stakeholders, uh, including project stakeholders and the public. So we looked to a recent, um, a recent project to illustrate this challenge and how we were over to, able to overcome. Um, the Northern Beltway was um, a major contentious project in the state of North Carolina. Uh, the DOT was proposing a major transportation interchange, um, and they had conveniently located it atop two parallel high voltage transmission lines. And the public was up in arms, already, you know, already a uproar occurring. Um, and so we as consultants came in, and it is our job to then find a new home for these transmission lines and figure out where they're going to go, uh, where they would be realigned. Um, it was highly um, constrained. We had a number of uh, red proposed bridge features here. Um, crane areas where cranes are coming up and down each day, not a good combination with high voltage transmission. Um, school and church to the west, um, you know, development up here to the north and east, uh, major wetland floodplain system. And so what do we even do with this? Um, so we really relied heavily on the data that we had, pulled all the GIS together, um, pulled all of our stakeholders and project team together along the way, and we're able to use that to um, identify alternatives here in yellow, uh, facilitate an analysis, and then be able to um, develop something communicable. And um, we ended up along the eastern side because there was a school and church and some community facilities off to the west. Um, and so we're able to find an agreeable solution um, between all of our stakeholders and, you know, come to an agreement and come to consensus by informing everyone along the way and driving consensus um, throughout the iterative process. So we'll leave you with this message um, from the father of GIS, who many of us were privileged to know, Roger Tomlinson. Thank you very much. Thank you.